First Peter chapter five. First Peter five. I see everybody wanted to hear, hear how this ended. You know, <laughs> anticipating the end of the book here. Then I read ahead. Uh oh. Cheated. <laughs> no, it's suffering. And tonight we'll see not just suffering physically, which they did, the early church did. Many of the church all around the world is still suffering. Um, but not just physical suffering, but spiritual suffering. Um, which we'll talk a little bit about that in chapter 5 here. But uh, we're reminded in chapter 5 that he's speaking to a church. Because this word comes up here. The elders. Well, that's two words, but the elders, and I think it's important to just make note that it's plural. Elders, plural. And he goes on to describe what it means with an S at the end of that, elders. <laughs> so, verse 1 of First Peter chapter 5, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also, Peter would say, I am an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feeding the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, and not for filthy lucre or greed of money, but of a ready mind. Verse 3, and Neither as being lords over... God's heritage, but being examples, in samples, to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fades not away. Likewise, you younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, and gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that He may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon Him, for He cares for you. There's the title of our message for tonight. He cares for you. So, just these first seven verses here, uh, we're reminded of order, and uh, the structure, if you will, of the church. That there's to be elders, and that's more than one guy in the church. There's not to be a head honcho, a head hog at the trough. And that's just what he'll be. If there's only one head hog at the trough, he'll be a hog. We can see that with the Pope. We can see that with many organized religions. How, how that it, it gets abused. And that they're, they're doing it so often, uh, verse 2 is totally kept out of their uh, vocabulary. It's kept out of not just their vocabulary, but they don't seem to understand what it means to be an elder, a bishop, a pastor, a reverend, whatever it is, a uh, minister. I think the best word for it is minister because we're reminded they're serving. They're to be serving people. That's the whole point of a pastor. And Peter here, in the first verse, it's subtle, but it's there, links himself with the elders. He doesn't say, I'm the hot shot, as our Catholic friends would say. He's the first pope. And somebody said, if Peter was the first pope, he didn't know it. Because he never seems to re reference to any of that in Scripture. It's quite, quite the opposite. You can never imagine Peter letting someone kiss his ring or his big toe as they do to the Pope. You can never imagine Peter taking glory and, and kind of, and if anything, instructing others to do so. To, to lift up any kind of human instrument, any kind of human uh, leader. 
No, an elder is simply someone who is mature in the Lord. Somebody put it best. The pastor that's in the church, many times people forget, it just means the church is a hospital. And all it means is that pastor's been a patient in that hospital a lot longer. So he knows where the bathroom's at. He knows which nurses can be mean. He knows where to avoid going. And so the pastor just been in the hospital longer. He's gotten more familiar with the great physician, with Jesus Christ himself. But that's all it is, is a, is a big hospital. Um, but with that said, there is to be this leadership in role for the elders. And that's what he's exhorting these guys, the elders that are among them there in Rome, most likely that's where this church that he's talking about and really it's the church as a whole. It's to you and me also. But that they would be feeding the flock of God, but remembering, verse 1, just like Peter remembered, the sufferings of Christ. Without the sufferings of Christ, note the order at the end of verse 1, without the sufferings of Christ, there can be no glory of His appearing. There's no glory in fact, his appearing is, is uh, detrimental or it's devastating to those who will not and refuse to suffer for, for Christ's sake and for, with the, the fellowship of his suffering. So remember that the book of 1 Peter, the subject is suffering. So up to this point, he's been telling us how, how that, yeah, it's hard to go through these things. And he's even likened it to being put in the fiery trial, the furnace, but it's going to be so precious. And you get a glimpse of that at the end of verse 1 with the sufferings of Christ, but also remember there's that partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. If you're feeding the flock of God as a good elder, as, as someone who's, you know, that's what pastors are supposed to be doing, is feeding the flock of God. And sadly, many pastors are more interested in social gatherings. They're more interested in business and making, making money, as he warns them against. Peter knew it was coming down the pike. No different. It was no different in Peter's day than it is in our day. Also, when it's a job and someone's been hired, it's kind of hard to do it not by constraint. What does that mean? Not being forced. But doing it, what does he say in verse 2? Not by constraint, not forced to be teaching, forced to be up there every week and, and preparing a Bible study, but ready, willingly, rather. This is something that, that you just, well, as Jeremiah puts it, if I don't do it, it's a fire that burns within my bones. And when you're called to it, that you really get what that means. You just there's no way to avoid it. And of course, not for filthy lucre, not 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 out of greed, um, but always of a ready mind, always being ready. And I love uh, to jot down next to verse three here, John chapter thirteen. What? happened in John chapter 13. In fact, it's the only gospel that's recorded. John 13, verses 4 through 5. Did you write that down? John 13, 4 through 5. Jesus washes Peter's stinky feet. And you have to know in verse 3, as Peter's writing this, well, as uh, Silas is writing, and Peter's telling him, we'll get to that, but uh, being lords over God's heritage. Not being uh, masters or lords over like the Pharisees used to do. Like many uh, denominations do even. Having this, and it's, it's interesting, the very word for elder is, is it's where we get our word Episcopalian. And it's where we get our word Presbyterian. 
And you look at the Presbyterian Church, you look at the Episcopalian Church, and they're lording over the laity or the people exactly what, what uh, they're not to be doing. You, they, they end up, and it's, it's something that happens as you give somebody a title of bishop, of pastor, of whatever that title might be, pride gets in there. In some way. So John chapter 13. Remember. I, I just have to be refreshed. But Peter's there. In John chapter 13. Among these guys. And Jesus is. Leading them by example. This is right before he's going to be. Betrayed. And go to his. Uh, basically to the cross. Um, he rises up from supper. Supper and laid aside his garments. And he took a towel and girded himself, and he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. And it goes on to say he came to Peter. And we all know the story. And Peter's, you're not going to wash my feet. And he learned, you have to, you have to picture it, as he's going through this, that he sees Jesus being, the end of verse 3, being an example to the flock. For them it was the disciples. Jesus taking a towel, laying aside his garment. There's even a picture within John chapter 13 of there, Jesus laying aside his deity and coming to earth to die on a cross so that he would be the exam the well yeah he would show the world what love is for one thing true love but also he would make the way he is the way and so Jesus is that ultimate example um, and we should all strive for that but there is kind of this this uh, tension if you will that we sometimes forget about. I forgot about it. Um, but I was reminded of it studying for this and studying through this. As leaders, we must have a position of authority that should and that will set you apart from the rest of the group. As a pastor, I shouldn't just be among the common people and doing what everyone does. There should be something different. A position of authority and responsibility has been given to me. So I'm not just, just doing what everyone else does. And, and there, there's a calling that's been placed on my life. But the best way I can explain this is mom and dad are not the kids' companions or friends. In the same way, the pastor is not just someone that's going to church like everyone else. And actually, you can use that in the workplace. Positions of managers, management, supervisors. There's something about their supervisor over you. And there could be some tension if you want to be his friend. If you want to kind of be buddy-buddy with the owner of the company or the, the management, managers. Whatever it might be. There's this tension. And, and as a parent, you want to be you want your kids to be open and able to come with to you for anything, but you don't want to be their friend, just like everyone else. There's something different going on. There's a higher calling, a very high calling uh, for us as parents, especially, that God has called us to something far greater than just friendship or companionship. In fact, the, word, the very word companion carries the idea of, I'm a child too. <laughs> I'm under someone else's authority just like you. And so, there's, there's uh, that tension that can be, you're in authority over them, but you don't want there to be this disconnect where they don't feel open and are able to come to you with problems. How can you have peace or unity, where there's no uh, uh, condescending feeling. 
And how can I continue to have that authority that's been given to me over them, but yet still have peace between you and the people? This, this is the answer. We already talked about it, but it's be an example. Lead by example. In other words, you don't tell people to go and do that. And a, a good pastor won't command and, and just be on his throne telling people to go and do this, that, or the other. But it's, he'll be saying, let's go. Come, let me show you. Leading by example. So that's a good leader. That's a good pastor that will do that. <clears throat> and of course, you want a crown that will fade not away. They, they had the Olympics. They were well uh, aware and well versed in co competing, competition. Wanting that crown. And for them it was just a crown that was going to fade away. It's going to perish. No big deal. You want a crown that's not going to fade away. And of course, Mark, uh, I almost titled the message from verse 4 there, but make sure you underline that, mark it well. He is the chief shepherd. When you're talking about an elder, pastor, someone who feeds the flock, some like to call us shepherds. I kind of cringe at that because I know he's the chief shepherd shepherd and that he's the only good shepherd there's no one good but him and so we are shepherds as pastors we are called to feed the flock of God but really make me more like you as we sang and as we'll sing after too Lord make me more like you why because you're the chief shepherd you're the divine example and then there's, to the younger, again, just like wives are told, to submit to their husbands, you younger, submit to your elders. And someone said, make sure you understand that just because someone's old doesn't mean, mean that they're mature. We see that a lot today. Just because someone's, you know, 50 years old, that's old. 60 years old. 70 years old. They could be a 70 year old immature, you know, <laughs> pervert, really. And yet, uh, that's not reason enough to show them some kind of respect, especially in the church. But the younger are to submit themselves just under those elders, and especially those of maturity. All of you be subject one to another. That's the secret to a good marriage. It's a secret to a good church. Is everyone is in submission one to another. First and foremost, before you're, you know, spouting out and telling your wife, I know the Bible, it tells me wives submit to their husbands. You want to make sure you get that submit to one another down first. And it keeps you from any of that. So, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility because we, we can't do any of this apart from grace. And how do you receive grace? It's through humility. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that He will exalt, exalt you immediately. Oh no, it doesn't say that. He may exalt you in due time. That could take 10,000 years. But you'll be exalted. It could take 20 years. It could take 5 years. It could take the millennium. But you'll be exalted in His time, in due time. And of course, casting all your care upon Him. For He cares for you. How much does He care about you? How much does God truly care about us? Do you know how many hairs are on your head? What about how many hairs are on your wife's head or your girlfriend's head or your whatever, your best friend? And we can be so stupid, we can be so foolish to think that my husband, my wife, my boyfriend, my girlfriend 
cares about me more than God does. Well, now we won't come at it out and say that, but many <laughs> are living in that way. They spend a whole lot more time with their wife, their husband, their girlfriend, their boyfriend, than they do God in, his, in the Word. Now, I have to be reminded of this all the time. God cares for me more than anyone else will ever. He knows how many hairs are on our head. That's wild. He puts every tear that I've cried, He saves them and puts them in a bottle. Ain't no human on earth that can do that. And of course, Jeremiah 29.11. What does Jeremiah 29.11 say? For I know the thoughts that I think about you. I know the plans that I have for you. Plans of prosperity, of peace, that you would prosper. And we think God makes up rules. We think we've we got to come and read His, His Word and it's such a bummer. Yet, He has such amazing plans for you and thoughts that He thinks. In fact, as the sand on the seashore, so are His thoughts towards you. So in light of all that, here's where the heavy gets... This is where it gets heavy hitting. Verse 8. Be sober. Sobriety. Means thinking clearly. Having a clear mind to be sober. Be vigilant. Vigilant carries the idea of staying alert. Because your adversary, the enemy, the devil as a roaring lion is walking around seeking whom he may devour or basically consume, destroy. Whom that devil that's walking around like a lion seeking whoever he, he may devour, you resist steadfast in the faith knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren, or the rest of the church, that are in the world. Verse 10, But the God of all grace, there it is again, the secret to, to resisting the devil, who has called us into, or unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, I like that. You're going to be suffering a while, but that He might make you perfect. Establish, or establish, strengthen and settle you. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, or Silas, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly, briefly exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. And the church that is in Babylon, or at Babylon, elect together with you, salute you, as and, and so does Marcus, my son, or John Mark. Verse 14, Greet ye one another with a kiss of charity. Peace be with you all that are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So there's a lot here in this last section. You could almost divide chapter 5 into those two sections. Because he gets into the battle realm. That's what that whole idea of be sober, be vigilant, vigilant rather, be um, on guard, verse 9, stand, resist, steadfast. These are terms that speak about going to battle. And Peter, you can read that and kind of think, what does Peter know about this? How does Peter know? Well, Luke chapter 22, verse 30, 31. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 31. You all might remember this, but you could jot it down just next to verse 8 and 9, just for... Uh, 
reference, but Luke chapter 22, verse 31, And Jesus said to Peter, Behold, Satan has desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. This is in, in the uh, time when, when uh, Jesus came back, found him sleeping. Happened quite a few times. What's the big deal, Lord? Well, Satan is desiring to have you. <laughs> in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. It reminds me of when God the Father, way back in Genesis chapter 4, verse 7, comes to Cain, the first murderer, you know, although he did not commit the first murder, he was the first murderer. Who committed the first murder? Satan. And with Adam and Eve. But, Genesis chapter 4, verse uh, 7, God sees Cain, and says, if you will do well, shalt thou not be accepted? But if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. That it shall, that, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him if you do well. <coughs> Same kind of idea with the warning of Satan. Now be... <laughs> Beware and, and careful. Be careful of sort of a cheerleading preaching. It's out there. It's real popular. Uh, pastors that kind of get into this whole thing with, I rebuke Satan, that toothless lion, come along and he's been declawed. He's, he's had his time and he's... And they speak as if Satan's nothing. Satan's weak. And that's just not biblical. In fact, Peter here says that Satan is as a roaring lion. And it's because he didn't really have anything else to compare him to. He thinks he's like a roaring lion. Note that as well. He's not a roaring lion. But he's like or as a roaring lion who walks around seeking whom he may devour. There's a few other titles. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. We just went over this not too long ago with the men's group. But Ephesians 2, 2. He's called the prince of the power of the air. Careful that you're not sitting under preaching and kind of involved with people. Sometimes it's just people that are giving Satan all the glory. All the time. <laughs> They're talking more about Satan than they are Jesus Christ. They get obsessed. You know, you know, and this time we don't have to so much uh, be concerned with demon possession, right? We have to be a little more concerned with demon obsession. Shows, cartoons, all this stuff about demons. That's nothing new, but... It's really true. We have to be careful of people that are obsessed with demons, angels, uh, Satan. <laughs> He's got his own church in San Francisco, the Satanic Church. And it's, it's silly, isn't it? But understand your enemy is very real. Recognize that there is a very real enemy that will completely destroy you and does everything in His power to destroy you. It's hard for me to sympathize with people that will let, you know, I don't know, an eight-year-old boy, or an eight-year-old girl for that matter, have at their fingertips the, the waves of the prince of the power of the air. The airwaves. Because Satan is desiring and has accomplished it in many cases, many families, to come after your kids, after your children. And for us to think that's being a loving parent, to just give the kid all access into cable networks, whatever it is, all access into internet realm, 
That's foolishness. But the, 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 uh, well, and you have to ask yourself, do you, do I really have a passion about protecting others? Do I really have a passion about protecting not just my kids, but others? Because that's Jesus Christ. Others centered, Philippians chapter 2, right? And we don't really, we're not familiar like they are in the, in the Bible Belt and, and some of the states, but it's, it's very uh, normal in many of these other states to go to church with a, with a weapon, you know, with a gun on your hip. And it's safe. Who's to say that some lunatic isn't going to walk in and will be a nightly news story and just shoots all these innocent people. And what's, what's so crazy is when these stories come out of some lunatic who's got, gone into some church or some school and he's shot these innocent people, you mean to tell me no one had a concealed weapon <laughs> to, to have a passionate heart and, and who's been trained to know how to use that weapon? No, instead, they're stripping all of the guns away from people in, in uh, fear of that gun going off. It's th this is even more important than that, than the whole thing with guns and gun control and all that. This is, e this is an eternal thing we're talking about. And this is protecting people spiritually, not physically. This is protecting your kids and those around you from a very real and a very crazy psychotic enemy that cannot be stopped. <laughs> it would seem. In fact, how do you stop him? <laughs> well, there's three different ways that we stop him. In, according to the text. By faith, stand in the faith, that is verse 9, whom you can resist the devil. How can I resist the devil? By standing in the faith. And that is looking in Hebrews 11 and seeing all of those heroes, those stories, those great men and women of faith. Understand, you have the same God dwelling in you. And if they overcame, believe you me, you can too. Especially some of the characters we have in there. But... Hebrews 11 is one big positive thing, right, to look at. But another big, big thing is how do we stand according to the end of verse 12? Drop down to verse 12. How do we stand? It's the true grace of God by which you stand. So whether you're standing to resist the devil, whether you're standing firm on what you believe, you stand in faith, not only that, but by grace. It's by grace. Everything's by grace. But I said there were three things, right? Faith, grace. Those are good names for a couple little kids, huh? <laughs> but, but, Matthew chapter 4, right? Matthew chapter 4. Verse 1 through 11. Satan himself comes, doesn't he? And our hero, our, our divine example, Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 4. What does he do each time the enemy attacks? How does Jesus resist the devil? It's the Word of God. It's the Word of God. Here's the thing though. Here's the problem. <laughs> Listen up. When Satan attacks... When Satan comes along, guess what? My Bible's not always in my hand. I'm not always ready with the Bible in hand. And don't use your phone as an excuse. This needs to be more than just on our notebook pads in, in our, in, that we can say, but we need to be able to digest this and memorize Scripture 
to the point where it's meaningful for each of us. Because that's where the enemy can attack at any time. And guess what? You'll be alert. You'll be on guard. You'll be standing firm. So the Word of God, by faith and by grace. Of course, none of it is, is possible apart from grace. All comes back to grace. Also, remember when you see little kids and you have little little guys, you have to tell them all the time, look where you're going. That's another thing. Be aware of your surroundings. Look at what's going on in the world. It's, it's I mean, the, the devil's having a heyday. But we have... The antidote. We, don't, we have the um, cure, if you will, for all of it. And it's His Word. It's, it's this the faith that we all stand in by grace. Um, the result. The result of uh, resisting the devil. The result of going through fiery trials, as He's talked about in last chapters. The results in verse 10. That after you suffer a little while, no, it doesn't say a little. It says a while. And, and this is where actually, I don't know who coined this, but this verse is where that whole saying, for some people in the world today, this is the best it will ever be. And for you and I as Christians, guess what? This is the worst it will ever be. Isn't that radical? And it does cause you to say, well, yeah, what is this suffering in comparison to the glory that awaits, the glory of heaven? You know, it, it really is suffer a little while, a while. You'll be suffered a while, but what's happening to you in that process is being you are being made perfect. Now that doesn't mean that everyone can see you glow and they can say, oh, he never sins. No, that's the very word there for perfect is mature that describes the elder in verse 1. The elders, they're mature in the Lord. They've been around. They know when it's right to speak and when it's just plain foolish. We've been going through the Proverbs every morning and it's amazing how it really is this contrast of the foolish blurts whatever comes on his mind and he just blurts it out. The wise know when it's acceptable to say this or that or the other. Or if it's worth even saying, right? <laughs> so, so that we desire to be mature men and women. That's more like him, again, that we would be established. That's an established strengthened and settled are all the same idea. What it is is a firm foundation to make strong that it will last, validate, or make sure. And I had to write Matthew chapter 7, Matthew 7, verse 24 through 29. The kids used to have a song that they sang all the time. The wise man builds his house on the sand? No. The wise man builds his house on the rock. It's the foolish man that builds his house on the sand. And that's this foundation. They're, they're going to be, you know, the trials that we go through, all that stuff. It's Think of it as a foundation for a house. And without those building blocks, without that pain, without that suffering, without that affliction... There's no firm foundation. It's all talk. It's all just sand. But it's to Him be the glory and the dominion forever. Now who's Silas? Silas becomes very uh, just kind of interesting. <laughs> In Acts chapter 15 through 18, he's Paul's traveling companion. And it's, it's always kind of neat to see the, Peter, the people that Paul knew, Peter came to know. It's one church. 
And early, the, the, the early church, uh, you know, theologians and things, they tried to divide Peter and Paul and say, well, Peter was like this. And they tried to do it with James too. That James had his thing, Peter had his thing, and Paul had his thing. In reality, you read the epistles, you read about, and you see how the Spirit worked. And how, how when we get to heaven, it's going to be a trip. It's going to be really neat to, to get Peter and Paul together, to get James in and on it, and John, and, and see just the, the unity that's there. And we know it's the Holy Spirit anyways. But Silas is among them. Silas is a faithful brother. I think I said he wrote this. No, I scratched that. That wasn't him. We get to uh, another note in verse 13 that becomes important. The, the church that is at Babylon. That's like saying the church that is in San Francisco on Haight and Ashbury. Or in San Francisco anywhere. Any street in San Francisco. There's a church there. And there is. There's a church in San Francisco. But that's, that's what Babylon was, was just Sin City. And most likely it was a code name that Peter used for Rome. Paul kind of did that same thing where he didn't want uh, to come right out and say Rome because you could get in a lot of trouble with the authorities in Rome for, for you know, hinting or even saying there was a church at, in Rome, the church of Jesus Christ that was there. So Babylon, most likely, that's, that's a, a code name for Rome, which Rome itself, by the way, was Sin City. It was just, just big time. Bad stuff. So, and then you get from the end of verse 13 here, Mark, John Mark, the writer of the Gospel of Mark, but he also is uh, in Acts chapter 12 and in 13, um, he's seen with Paul as well. Uh, Mark is the cousin or the nephew of Barnabas. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, you can read about all that. So another interesting thing. But Mark, we know, wrote the Gospel of Mark. And it, it wasn't necessary. Like Matthew, the book of the Gospel of Matthew was from Matthew's perspective. perspective. He walked with Jesus. He knew Jesus. He saw Him. And John, same way. But Luke... And John Mark, they're kind of the outsiders, if you will. They, they didn't necessarily meet Jesus in the flesh. Now it's debatable with John Mark, because John Mark was alive. And in fact, in, in uh, one of the chapters, I think it's when Jesus is arrested in Gethsemane, Mark could be referring to himself as he talks about this naked young man that flees and, and they take his tunic, whatever he's wearing, and so he's in such a rush to get out of there because he's going to get killed if he's with the band that's there with Jesus. Um, anyways, it's very likely that it's a reference to Mark because he was a young man. But what's neat about it is we don't really think about it being the gospel through Peter's eyes. But it is. You read Mark's gospel... And it's Peter's telling, because Peter walked with Jesus, didn't he? Peter had this relationship with Jesus. And most likely, Peter didn't know how to write with his hand. Mark did. <laughs> and so God sent these guys. Peter was just a dumb, big fisherman, right? A lot of, a lot of people forget that he didn't, probably most likely didn't have the education to, and we don't know for sure, but um, one big reason uh, that Mark becomes, uh, and what, is, what does Peter call Mark? His son. That's like Tim, uh, Paul talks of Timothy, his son. So very close relationship. And so uh, it becomes pretty, pretty neat. Or not. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I like it. The family of God. And all of it, again, all of it is to remind us that uh, 
To God be the glory. It's not about uh, anyone's ability <laughs> to believe that God can do it. Because we mentioned, I mentioned faith, how we can resist the devil. There's a big, big uh, misunderstanding of faith, even. Just like the same people that scream about the devil and he's powerless and they're diminishing and trying to, to say, you know, those same people destroy what faith is. And they fall into the same kind of danger, the same kind of trap that, that uh, the disciples even found themselves falling into, uh, thinking it's the person that has such great faith. That all of a sudden it becomes about that person. But I like this quote. It's not about my ability to believe what God can or can't do. Because it becomes about me. <laughs> but all it is is trusting and casting my cares on Him. That's what faith is. Everything that I think might work, everything that I might have and muster up in my ability, no, I just cast it on Him. For He cares for me. He cares for us. More than anyone could ever think or imagine. God cares for each and every one of us. I love it. Well, Father, we thank You for Your peace that passes understanding. Lord, thank You for Your Word this evening. Lord, I pray we would resist the devil, that he would flee from us. And when those times come, when the temptation comes our way, that just as You did in Matthew chapter 4, we would... Know your word and just be able to fend off the devil and all his schemes, all of his fiery darts that will come. Lord, may we be able to extinguish them with the shield of faith, the belt of truth, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit. Lord, the feet that are shod to go out and preach the gospel, the gospel of peace. We thank you, Lord, that you know, you know the end and the beginning, Lord. You know all of it. We can place our faith, our trust, rely totally on You. I pray we would in every area of our lives, even as we try to take little pieces back, that, Lord, You would keep us from leaning on our own understanding. Thank you so much. We just respond in worship now as we sing these songs. We want to be more like you. Amen.